Good evening and welcome once again to the Marty Heiser program. I'm so glad you joined us. I hope you uh, survived that downpour last night. I was down in Manhattan at the time and uh, actually hail was pounding the streets of Manhattan. It was something to see that electric storm coming through. Uh, I hope you're all here having uh, the nice, lazy, hazy days of summer settle in because the next 60 minutes you will be entertained, you will be informed. And another thing, we ask you to participate in this show. The phone number here, you can call in directly, 203-438-2003. That number again, 203-438-2003. We want you to call in and be a part of the show because tonight we're going to be talking about the economy, where we're headed, what the tax policies are going to be, and what it means to your bottom line. And not only that, but we also have the Economic Development Director for the City of Danbury, none other than Bruce Tumala, will be right here in this studio. So if you have some ideas on how to economically develop Danbury, now's your time. We are going to have the man right here in the studio. I want to start this evening, and I want to keep it short because, frankly, that's what my co-host wants me to do. But I know that everyone that I'm, listening, that I'm talking to right now over this vast nutmeg state is probably going to vote Democratic, probably leaning liberal, probably thinks that our president is a wonderful guy doing a great thing. It's all the dastardly Republicans that won't let him do the right thing. But this past week, and I know some of you don't like it when I hack on the president and, and so forth, and, and I've tried. On this very studio, we had uh, Al Robinson, when uh, Barack Obama was elected president, full of hope and change. We thought, hey, this could really work out. Four long years later of his liberal economic policies, a grinding recession, and here we're left with an election where he's just simply trying to pit black against white. He's trying to pit rich against poor. He's trying to pit the wage earner against the wage payer. He's trying to pit freedom to work or free to work states against union states. It's really terrible to see what's going on in our country as one group is pitted against another. And that's all you can really do when the economy that you developed has, uh, has had 8.2% unemployment. We've seen up to 50 million people on uh, welfare and, and food stamps. It's just a mess out there. In my own town of Ridgefield, I'm on the Board of Finance. Just last night, we were going through people that are in arrears on their taxes homes that are being foreclosed on. And this isn't Detroit. This is Ridgefield, Connecticut. 21 homes going on the auction block because they can't make ends meet. This is trouble. We're in trouble. Our economy's in trouble. And then this past week, I have to watch on television as my president, the elected leader of my country, says, if you've got a business, you didn't build that. You know, I I'll tell you, I've had advantages in my life. But I took a painting business. I started out washing windows. I, I would go from one house to another on a bicycle with a bucket of water over the handlebars and a ladder on my shoulder. When that ladder would clank against the asphalt of the, uh, of the street when I was going from one house to another to wash windows in suburban Chicago, it hurt. Well, guess what, Mr. President? I didn't see you there. I didn't see any other Democratic bureaucrat there helping me out. And then when you try to meet a payroll 26 times a year, I don't see the government coming in and helping me meet the payroll. So I took that company and built it up, and now I've got a modest painting business. And I'm telling you something, Mr. Barack Obama and all you other liberal bureaucrats in Washington and Hartford, you didn't do jack for me. You didn't do anything. So don't tell me if you've got a business, you didn't build it. I did build it. And I'm proud of it. And I'm tired of hearing from my elected officials that we owe it all to government. And that if there's any problem, turn to government. You need health care? Turn to government. You don't have enough money? Turn to government. You need proper nutrition? Turn to government. Government's going to take care of everything. Guess what? It doesn't work. It hasn't worked. We need to change. I'm just, I, when I saw him stand there and go, if you've got a business, First of all, what the heck is that word? You got a business. Like they're passing these things out at, at, at town hall or something like that. Hey, you want a business? Hey, here you go. Go right ahead. You don't got a business. You build a business. And it has very little to do with politicians and them helping out at all. 
No president, no congressman, no municipal bureaucrat was helping me build a business. No one gave me that business. And to have the president of the United States, it just shows how completely out of touch he is with the free enterprise system. But guess what? There's socialism and there's communism. And the way we're going right now is the government's just going to take care of everything. Well, guess what, Mr. and Mrs. Unemployed American? Guess what, Mr. and Mrs. sitting in your house and having it worth 30, 40 percent less than it used to be? How do you like the socialism? How's it working out for you? You're going to pay more in taxes? We've got an, uh, an economic uh, savant here who's going to lay it out in chapter and verse. We've got all that ahead of us. So when I saw that, it just ticked me off. And thank goodness I had this dopey TV show so I can get it off my chest because my doctor says if I don't, it builds up and it causes me indigestion. Okay, that said, I'm glad I got that off my chest. And now... But how do you really feel, Marty? That's how I feel. <laughs> I mean, you know, you build a business. It's not a big business. I'm telling you, I struggle every two weeks to meet my payroll. And the last thing I want is some government official showing up at my door saying... Hi, we're from the government. We're here to help. Oh, great. From the government. You didn't, I didn't get this business. I built the business. And, uh, and uh, I did build the business, regardless of what the president says. So can, I, right. can I add one comment to that? Please do. I don't know what else is to go ahead. Well, so, so the, the thing that just really strikes me with his comments this past week saying, if you're successful, that's not because of, of what you did. It's because of the government building the roads that made your business possible yeah. and give, give everybody else the credit. Yeah. Okay, so when a business is successful, everybody else can take the credit. Yeah. But when it fails, like all the, the, the Wall Street houses that failed over the course of the last four years, who does he blame? Yeah. All the CEOs. Yeah. So if you succeed, someone else, is, someone else gets the credit. But if you fail, it's all yours. I'll tell you, it just, it just to me, it's like, it's like we're in Godlang Alice in Wonderland here or something like that. I mean, be, you know... It, it, do you need to explain the basics of, of, of a free enterprise system? I mean, I really think, I mean, Linda McMahon, who I think is a great senator, uh, candidate for senator, had a debate with Blumenthal. And it was a classic question. He said, where does a job come from? And Blumenthal, a longtime uh, uh, bureaucrat, you know, couldn't answer. Well, a uh, job comes from here. Linda McMahon, you know, you may not like her business she's in, because in spandex, faking fights, but uh, that's the business she's in. <laughs> but uh, she could tell you, you know, you provide a good and a service, and you're able to employ people and charge enough for that service where you can pay your employee and make a profit and reinvest it in that service. You produce solar panels, and guess what, Solyndra and government agencies, you don't produce solar panels that cost $6 each when they're selling on the open market for $2 a piece because you think it's a good idea to have solar energy. Let's just throw money at it, and oh, by the way, if it's guys that have been invested in my campaign, let's throw money at that. That's really good. And another one, this I just heard recently, those Volt cars, you know, uh, uh, electric cars, so uh, all the butterflies and robins will have places to live and we won't uh, consume that dreaded gasoline. Well, guess what? Turns out those Volts cost $250,000 to manufacture, and they're trying to sell them for $40,000, and they can't give them away because they don't work good. But guess what? When you're paying $40,000 for a car that costs $250,000 to produce, guess who's making up the difference? That's right. You overburdened taxpayer are paying the difference. But wait, it gets better because, you know, if we can't tax you guys enough, you know what we're going to do? We're just going to go out and borrow the money. So now we're in the situation where 42 cents out of every dollar that's being spent on food stamps, on these dopey Volt cars, and all this other government spending gets borrowed. We're, you know, you got a nice little cute kid at home right now, probably over there playing with the Barbies right now wanting to come in, dad, let's play catch. Well, guess what? Look at those little kids because you're taking all this debt and you're putting it right on their hands and saying, you guys got to pay for this because we can't get our act together and get our spending under control and we can't tax anymore. We just can't. Oh, don't get me started. Michael, Marty. you're our guest. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm going to take a chill pill here and we're going to get to people that are rational that actually know how to add figures and can tell us the nuts and bolts of what we're heading into. My guest is Michael Actus Grandi. He's an economist extraordinaire. This is a man who knows a thing about balancing budgets and seeing what public policy has to do. 
uh, with your personal income and your personal finances. And Michael, I just want to turn it over to you. What are these new taxes going to mean to the average guy? Please save the show. I'm busting a blood vessel here. Go right ahead. Well, if things go as planned, the news will not be good. The news will not be good because um, if Congress fails to act before the end of the year, the so-called Bush tax cuts will expire, and then we will essentially go back to the tax law as it was more than 10 years ago. And in a nutshell, what that means is that's going to mean uh, higher income tax rates, higher long-term capital gains rates, higher rates on dividends, uh, reduced uh, benefits for tax deductions. Uh, on balance, um, taxes will go up. I'll get to the graphic in a second mm -hmm. uh, for you. Uh, added to that will be the impact on the uh, Affordable Health Care Act and essentially what will be the increases in Medicare taxes as applied uh, to additional earned income, income from salaries, bonuses, compensation, for example, and on the additional tax on investment income. And essentially, uh, I'll give you an idea in terms of how much uh, additional tax revenue that's going to raise. Uh, let's, uh, let's focus first on the impact of the expiration of the Bush tax cuts on Let's call it maybe a couple of typical, uh, typical situations. Okay, so we have here a salary for single people, $40,000 a year. Walk us through that. All right, so in that particular individual, single individual, earning $40,000, uh, currently uh, his tax under the current law is about $4,200. Uh, with the expiration of the Bush tax cuts and some higher rates, mostly in that particular case, from the elimination of a 10% bracket on the first uh, seven, 8,000 of income, uh, what you have is a higher, uh, about $300 of higher tax in that particular case. Now, you know, while it may sound much, may, while it may not sound like much, maybe for this individual, you know, maybe that's a car payment. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, uh, it's all relative to a certain extent, but it could be significant. I want to focus a bit also. It's not part of the Bush tax cut, but it, it's worth discussing. And that is the impact on that you see there on the bottom, the $800 item, uh, the elimination of the temporary payroll tax cut. Right. Uh, that was done. The Social Security rate um, for years had been at 6.2% of the first, uh, currently it's the first hundred, roughly 110,000 of, of salary. And as a means of stimulating the economy, that rate was dropped from 6.2% down to 4.2 right. as a means of giving some everybody some extra spending power. And this particular example, what it did for that $40,000 individual is it gave him or her an extra $800 of spending power. Right. Well, that provision is due to expire at the end of this year. And as a result, and I wanted to weave that into the example to show what the impact was. Right. In this particular case, for this individual, this individual would have $1,100 of uh, income less to spend. Right, right, right. Now, in your second uh, column... So basically, it's ahead. just the uh, federal government taking a big vacuum cleaner to everyone's wallet and sucking money out of the economy, money they could spend on having, say, their house painted. Money they could spend on saying, uh, having an investment advisor put money into savings and investments that could be reinvested in the private sector. It's a government coming through and sweeping money right out of the economy. Or perhaps maybe that's a retirement. Maybe that's an additional amount to that individual's 401k plan or 403b plan. Yeah. All right, so now we're going to the guy with $75,000. This gets a little painful. Well, that's a married couple making $75,000. Oh, oh, those must be those rich fat cats, huh, that we keep hearing about that aren't paying their fair share. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, two children, uh, an example with two children in that particular case. Now, uh, currently they're paying about, uh, about uh, 4500 4, like. currently. Now, look at the impact here. And, and a large part of the change, a lot of, large part of the change that occurs here is as a result of the elimination of the child tax credit, 
which essentially uh, was a thousand dollars per child, it was a credit, direct credit, which means right. it directly reduced the tax right. uh, if you had a child at home under 18. Now, in this particular example, two children, two thousand dollars. That break would be eliminated, coupled with the fact of the higher uh, tax rates. Uh, you can see a pretty uh, significant change here. Thirty-six hundred dollar tax increase, it looks like. Now, add in the fact that here again, let's uh, uh, let's roll in the uh, non-extension of that payroll tax cut. Right. And you've got a pretty pronounced effect so uh, on that household. So, in, in case number one, where, where a person is single. The net impact of all these changes was what was the number? Eleven $1 hundred. Okay, so in, in the married couple making seventy-five thousand is a total of how much? Five thousand one hundred dollars. That's staggering. Sure. That's significant. No, it's dramatic. I mean, you're, you're approaching what eight percent increase? Yeah, that, that yeah. In taxes, yeah. there goes disposable income, right? Yeah. Now, wasn't this the president that said he wasn't going to raise taxes on the middle class? Um, I think it was. I think I, I saw a, a, ver, a video montage of him going, if you make less than twenty-four, or twenty-five, or two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, you won't be impacted enough. I think it was right after he said that Medi that the Obamacare wasn't a wasn't a tax. A tax. Uh, yeah, that's not a tax increase. And it's seventy not, seventy-seven percent of Obamacare is going to be uh, paid for by people making less than one hundred twenty-five grand a year. Yeah. Those people are going to get squashed. Count me in one as, as one of those people. Yeah. Well, anyways, do you have any good news? Do you have any other well, what, graphics what, for just, us? What just, else do you have to just share? Just a comment. Just a comment. What, what I think is interesting about all this is that most all Americans seem to agree that taxes should be cut for 98% of tax-paying Americans. <laughs> but, oh, that 2%. Yeah. And, and perhaps what a, a, a good segue into showing what the impact is on a, uh, let's call the individual a higher earning uh, American. Okay. All right. And by the way, they're going to put the phone number up too. If you want to ask uh, our guest, Michael Actus Grande, any questions how this would apply to you, the phone number is right there on your screen, 438-2003. Don't be frightened by my outbursts. I'm really mild-mannered and uh, somewhat passive. Uh, but uh, feel free to call in, 438-2003. We'd love to hear from you. Okay, so we have the next graphic up. This is an example of, let's call this individual, a Fairfield County executive okay. with a million dollars of salary and bonus, Okay. $50,000 of dividend income, and $100,000 of long-term capital gains. And to just kind of make my numbers uh, work effectively, I uh, threw in $137,000 for deductions, things like, uh, the most significant of which, by the way, would be his Connecticut income tax. Okay. Real estate taxes, mortgage interest, and charitable deductions. Okay. Now, uh, salary and bonus is a million dollars a year. So this is one of those dreaded guys that need their house painted, or if you go on vacation, or if you want to have values of your houses go up, this guy is has a wherewithal to buy that house. Now his tax currently is approximately two hundred eighty-nine thousand wow. dollars. All right. I just wish he'd pay his fair share, but go ahead. With the with the elimination of the Bush tax cut, going back to letting the tax rates and tax law revert back to where it was over 10 years ago, you have a pretty pronounced increase in tax to about uh, $367,000 in okay. that case. Right. Now, most of that is occurring, A, because the tax on dividend income in that particular case is going from 15 to 39.6%. Right. The tax rate on long-term capital gains is going from 15 to 20%. Ouch. And uh, the top rate on, on, on income, on his compensation, uh, and, and on the dividends, of course, in that case, is 39.6%, an, uh, an increase from currently 35%. Okay. So you're getting a pretty pronounced increase as far as that goes. Right, right. Okay, go ahead. All right. Um, now, uh, what you're also seeing there is the effect of the Affordable Care Act. Okay. And I, I specifically wanted to put that into this illustration. Right. Uh, now, again, that's not part, has nothing to do with the Bush tax cut or whatever, but it is a provision right. that is to take effect in 2013. Two key components. A, an increase in the Medicare tax on compensation right. above $250,000 in that particular case. Okay. All right, and you see that there was an element there yeah, let's get the graphic back up and uh, go ahead. About, uh, I, think, I think the figure was about $6,700 uh, 
okay. uh, additional tax on compensation right, over the uh, right. two fifth over two hundred fifty thousand in that case. Now you also have the Medicare tax on investment income when income level exceeds two hundred fifty thousand dollars. In that particular case, you see about a fifty seven hundred dollar impact there. Okay. We can go, we'll go. We'll get her back on. But go ahead. Now, you know. further, what I also did is threw in the impact of the elimination of the temporary payroll tax cut, okay. which for that particular individual is an increase in tax of about twenty-two hundred dollars. Okay. okay. The overall impact for that particular individual is a tax increase of about ninety-two thousand dollars. Holy Toledo! So one one thing I want to just point out and in, in bring Mike in tonight is yeah. to emphasize the fact that he's one hundred percent nonpartisan. And yeah. the beauty of bringing him in is he's giving you the facts. Whether you like him or not, these are the facts. It's not biased. He's not selling anything. Right. Of course, if you want a really good tax accountant, he's the guy. But, I mean, people need to know that. So, Mike, let me ask you something, and I, I don't expect you to have this data on you know, well, right. your tongue. But, Go ahead. Okay, in 2012, the break-even point on average for people, they had to work until about what date to break even I to pay the taxes? I think the magic date, it goes until like early May. I think according to the Tax Foundation, it's sometime in early May. May 11, 12, somewhere in there. So, somewhere in that time so, frame. So it sounds to me when I do the numbers and adding $92,000 to a guy that's paying, you know, making a million dollars a year, it sounds like he's adding almost a whole month to his break even I point. suspect you're probably going to you're easily adding another three four weeks. I it's incredible. So you're working over almost six whole months just to break even to get the government paid up so they can dole out money to Solyndra and pay for two hundred fifty thousand dollar volts. Is well, that fair? Well, here, here's another key point. Another be careful. key aspect. He's luring you in there. You got to be the honest he, broker. He's weaving his web. He is. He is. Be very careful. You're like Switzerland. You got a crazy man over here See, and this cunning if I, guy over there. If I there. get any more worked up, I might be the host of the show. <laughs> 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 I, I, I'm going to need it very soon. Uh, I believe the budget estimates are from the supplemental Medicare tax right. on earnings and on investment income, the 0.9% on earnings and the 3.8% on investment income. Mm -hmm. uh, the projection is an additional $200 billion over the next 10 years to, quote, pay for health care. Well, those are the projections. Is it true that when you sell your house, part of the profits from the sale of your house can also be confiscated and put into open Well, market? what will happen is, to the extent you've got a, a long-term capital gain, mm -hmm. that gain essentially will go into the mix uh -huh. uh, in terms of determining whether or not your income is going to be subject to that 3.8% Medicare tax. But remember, you do have, and for most people, what didn't change is you do have the 250,000 uh, exclusion from gain on the sale of a principal residence for a single individual and half million dollars. So who has a gain right now on, on a, a residence? Somebody, heard, somebody maybe who purchased their house 20, 25 years ago and didn't leverage it to the hill. So San Bernardino Someone maybe who built their house when Benjamin Franklin was delivering the mail might have a gain on a house right about now. So I heard that in San Bernardino, California, for example, 75% of the people are underwater on their homes. Yeah. Staggering number. Is that one of the uh, uh, that, cities in San Francisco that has declared bankruptcy? Yeah, they're going bust, yeah. That's uh, Stockton. That's Stockton. Stockton. Well, well, San Bernardino, seven too. Or eight San Bernardino's where Yeah, yeah, they're just lined the up at this point. The dominoes are falling. Right. But, you know, it's pretty much run by Democrats, liberal Democrats that care. And they, they understand. Well, and they, Scranton, they, you know, and they're Scranton concerned this, about the right, needs. In Scranton last week, what the mayor did there, what, all he could do was he took all wages for uh, city employees down to seven fifty an hour. Minimum wage. Yeah. yeah, so unfortunately, they take you right to the edge and then they push you off. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's uh, it's working really good. This whole you know government's going to take care of everything, just tax everyone to the hill. It's going to. We need Scott out. Walker's everywhere. I'll tell you that. Oh, I agree. Uh, let me add a couple of other provisions Please here do. that I think uh, you I, thoroughly I think, depressed I think, us. You I might as there well are no sharp objects in here. Well, now, now no, let me let no me no loaded firearms then, uh, Let me depress. Everything's going to be fine. Hope and change. Hope and change. All right, I'll depress some of the small business people then. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Well, right. they got their, if you got a business, you didn't build it. You just got it. Yeah. You just got it. This is the government that built the road. This is probably a good segue you, in light you, of you your like diatribe at the opening of the show. Things like that. Where did you got your business from? Did someone got it to you? Or did you build I, it up? I started from scratch. Did you, did you start from, did you start, you know, calling my your basement. relatives? Did you, your basement? No, started in my basement. There, you know, and, 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 you, and you scratch and you eat rejection for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you get hammered and you knock on doors and you say, please let me handle your account. And they say, what are you going to do for me? You ain't going to, oh. Anyway, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm well, for example, uh, let's talk about small business for a second. Okay. Uh, 
the uh, right now under current law, you've got the ability to directly write off $139,000 of equipment for your business. Okay. Uh, next year, that uh, unless something is done to change it, next right. year that'll drop to $25,000. Hold on one second, uh, caller. Do you got a business? I have a comment and a question. Do you have a business though? Um, no, not this time. Well, you need to get in touch with the government because apparently they're just giving <laughs> these businesses away. Get yours, okay? Um, on the economy, uh, does the professional there agree that um, to stimulate this economy at a national level, we need to um, decrease the corporate tax nationwide. It's what the highest in the civilized world, industrial world. And my question is, on the uh, Obama, uh, you know, Biden Obama health care plan, for the for the um, mandate. If companies say um, um, we're not going to pay that mandate, do you think, in your professional opinion, that the IRS has the funding to take everybody to court that says no, and um, to, you know to try to make them pay that penalty? And I'll hang up and let uh, you caller. Me. Just one, one quick question: Do you yeah. get? And if it's too personal, tell me to go take a flying leap. But do you get a federal tax rebate? Like after you pay your taxes, do you get a check from the government once you file your taxes? Do you get a rebate? Okay, um, I'm, I'm under the poverty line. I don't make enough. Um, I'm a disabled veteran. I did not even file this year. Okay, so, well, a lot and, of... Go ahead. And even, well, just let me say, and um, there's something about, um, um, you know, people uh, getting money back that don't, you know, don't put it... it look. I'm not going to ask the government for money back, all right, unless I go out and uh, do a job and then put in, and yes, if I'm, okay. you know, No, but I'm my point... My point is that a lot of a lot of Americans, you know, they have their withholding tax, and you pay it, and then when you finally file your taxes, lo and behold, the government has taken too much out, so they gave you a tax refund. A lot of people get tax refunds. It's very standard. Guess what? You don't pay for your medical insurance or the kind and, and type that they want. They're going to take money out of that refund. Take it to the yeah, bank. Marty, Marty, I really don't think that the government is going to go around to put the business leaders of America in jail or try to penalize them. To, you know, to a great degree. I don't think that the government is going to put them in jail. But, my, you know, again, the question is, do you think the IRS has the um, funding to take the money from um, businesses? Okay, and thanks very much for the road uh, guideline. All right, thanks a lot. Appreciate the call. Well, what about that? Well, we needed to ask him which war he served in. Uh, yeah, no, I, I appreciate, you know. All right, so call, war call if you're listening, call back in. We want to hear which war you served in. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, look, can I handle one piece of that? Please do. In, in terms of lowering the corporate tax, because that's that's an opinion thing, and you always hate to express opinions. Well, we discussed it. In fact, when I was mm -hmm. on uh, when I was on last year, that's one of the points that I noted: to the fact mm -hmm. that uh, when you add our when you add our rate to the uh, um, twenty rate of twenty seven states, we've got the highest uh, marginal corporation tax rate in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're competing against Singapore and other Asian countries at five percent. So we're up at what, 35 to 40 percent at the corporate 35 level? Percent, uh, 30, 35 percent federal. Uh, yeah. Currently, that uh, there is no provision uh, for dropping that rate. It's been talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, and people don't make the connection that if you drop the corporate rate, somehow that's deemed evil. But in reality, it enables corporations to hire people and put America back to work. Well, here's the key. On the flip side, you have General Electric for, I believe it was uh, 2010, that had a zero federal tax rate, uh, taking advantage of bonus depreciation, mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. example, uh, which will also be eliminated in 2013. Bonus. Basically, the ability to r immediately write off 50% of the cost of a new asset yeah, for business. For the show? Uh, once upon a time, it was 100%. Okay, hold on. 50%, that will go away next year. Uh, so I think something's going to have to be done uh, for competitiveness. Uh, what about the mid-sized business that maybe is more service and not capital intensive, is profitable? They're paying that high rate. Mm -hmm. Hold on one second. Caller, you have a question for Michael Actus Grande. Go ahead. I think, the, I think we should get the war back. The, we, Obama said early this morning, he said, I think the war is going to get over with. He's trying to get Romney back in the same direction. And uh, how, how, how does he see, feel about the war when he thinks that the war is going to fight back? So you're talking about the war in Afghanistan? Yeah, 
Okay, well, good question. Thank See, right, you. Right now, there are a lot of wars to choose from, whether it's our involvement in Syria, Libya, you know, next stop is Iran. I mean, they, they just don't end. Good point. Uh, I think everyone is against war, and hopefully they're wrapping up these wars. But go right ahead with what you were just saying. No, I think that the, uh, uh, I think also to the uh, caller's point, too, I, I think this uh, temporary payroll cut, and you can see the effects, particularly on, on individuals with uh, lower income. All right. Uh, I think it's going to be extended indefinitely. Now, now the elephant in the room, of course, that no one's talking about, is the impact that this is having on the social security system. Wow. I mean, the stimulus is important, but you have a social security system that is in trouble. Mm -hmm. I believe the disability fund is going to run out of funds, I think, by 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, you're trading off one problem, mm -hmm. really, for one down the road. You're kicking the can down the road. Right. And interestingly enough, in the data that came out last week, mm -hmm. there were 85,000 new jobs supposedly created. Now, I, don't, I mean, they, they fudge the numbers. Guess how many people signed up for disability? 85,000. 85, yeah, That's great, serious. huh? It's a, seri it's, it's a serious problem. Yeah. It's a serious problem. I'd like to mention one other point. Please. Uh, one of the provisions that's going to expire by the end of this year, and again, mm -hmm. it's not part of the uh, Bush tax cuts, but it uh, was enacted in uh, 07, is the uh, Mortgage Forgiveness Debt Relief Act. And, and, Sounds and that's, good. that's significant. That's significant because the best way to describe what it does is with an example. Let's assume that someone purchased a home for $300,000 and mortgaged the purchase. They took a second mortgage for $200,000, uh, put it into their home, uh, so now that they have $500,000 invested into their home. Let's assume that that house is now uh, down to uh, $300,000 and the individual does not have the ability uh, to make those payments. And further, uh, the prospect of that home returning to uh, its original value is virtually nil. At least under current law, if that debt is forgiven, renegotiated, part of a short sale or whatever, under current law, that income forgiveness, and income forgiveness is income, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that will currently escape tax. Mm -hmm. That benefit disappears next year. Mm -hmm. And to a situation where you already have a serious housing problem that's still festering, um, that I think is going to have a significant impact. Now, maybe not so much in Fairfield County, but I think it's certainly going to have an impact in the rest of the country. Gotcha, gotcha. One thing, I, the other thing before we let Mike go. Yes. Um, I just wanted to me mention that we get more requests for Mike to appear on this show and update us than any other guests that we've ever had on the show. I appreciate that. And that's fantastic. So we got to, you know, we're going to count the minutes before we can get you back on. And uh, the one other data point I was going to throw out there is, remember when uh, Clinton was running for office and he was walking, going around the country saying, are you better off than you were four years ago? Yeah. And uh, so you have to ask yourself now, are we better off? than we were four years ago. Well, the answer is the average net worth for the average American has declined by 40% in the last three years. So I guess the answer is no. What do you think? Per capita, Canadians are wealthier than us. Isn't that something? Do you know how devastating that is if you're married to a Canadian and have four Canadian brother-in-laws? But don't tell Obama that because that's his role model uh. of socialism. My guest has been Michael Actus Grande, economist extraordinaire. I want to thank you for joining us very much. You've thoroughly bummed us out. The suicide hotline number right now is exploding. Floor, right? We can't jump. Yeah, you can't jump. There's no loaded firearms anywhere. Uh, so that's a good thing. Thank you so much, and, and guarantee you'll come back. Uh, we've had uh, Linda McMahon on this show. We've had Chris Shays on this show. We've had my next guest's boss. Mayor Mark Bowden is on the show, has been on the show before, but I am thrilled because we're taking this economic stuff, and, and right now we are going to bring it right home to uh, here in Danbury, Connecticut, and the greater Danbury area, so you'll have that as well. But I have joining us tonight the Economic Development Director for the City of Danbury, a good friend of mine, uh, forewarned, Bruce Tumala. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Marty. Thanks for having me on after such a great and popular guest. And may I say that any man that wears a pink tie 
is very secure in himself. And there you are. Now, is that salmon or is that actually pink? This would be real pink. Real I pink. Took See? took lead from Larry Ditkoff. Larry Ditkoff was a pink tie. He's just a hero. And Larry Ditkoff's a man's man, and he's very, very secure. And I just appreciate Well, it was that. this or the SC colors, and I thought I'll go with them next time. A little known fact about our <laughs> beloved economic development director is he is a member of the Alumni Association for the USC Trojans, that would be the University of Southern California. Yep, you know those cheerleaders out there in uh, out there in California. And we, we used to be the Pac-10. Oh, I guess it's the Pac-28 yeah, or yeah, something. By the time they're done, it probably will be. All right. Well, you have the enviable job of developing economic activity in the greater Danbury area, and you work for our beloved mayor, mm -hmm. Mayor Mark Bowden. I do. And uh, tell me a little bit about what your day-to-day -day life is and, and how you got the job and what you like sure. doing with it. Oh, and by the way, we're going to put up the phone number. This is a live call-in show. So if this man has messed up in any way, I want you to call right here on live television and tell us what he's done. But go <laughs> ahead. So, uh, well, first of all, I wanted to mention uh, this show used to be called, what, like, Rules of Ideas, home no, ideas at Work and Beyond. And you change it to the I Marty Heiser Show. I change it to Heiser the Marty Show. So you made it about yourself. I am a self-absorbed jerk. I think that has been firmly established. As a matter of fact, my wife has just joined us in the studio. Right. And if we have enough time, she can come up here and share with the vast viewing yeah, audience well, Marty, the truth of this. Marty, you better get back on the show if she takes uh, over. You know I know, I know. I've heard her actually say that. No, it's that, true. So. No, I've, I uh, renamed it Marty right. Heiser Show. Right. I just thought it had a nice ring to it, right. which you know tells you a little bit more about me. Well, it, it, it's too long a story to tell you actually how I got here, other than to say that uh, I did have a corporate background and uh, spent uh, 20 years, the last uh, probably 10 of them in international sales and you know, global accounts and that sort of thing. Right. Um, kind of had an opportunity to step back and say, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? And I decided I really should be a consultant. Okay. Um, I really enjoyed that, you know, solving problems and doing things a lot more than I ever did uh, selling. And so uh, I spent a couple of uh, terms with some blue chip consulting firms and uh, started my own firm and uh, started working with some uh, uh, nonprofits specifically. Uh, I'm, I'm skipping over a lot of steps here, but basically uh, in that whole experience, uh, I got to be exposed to what is come known as economic development. I had no idea what it was. Right, right. And, and if you would like, for example, if you looked up in Wikipedia, what is economic development, you, you'll just get lost. Okay. So <laughs> I would say basically that it is about creating jobs and revenue for the city and for But you know, it, it's interesting to me because I happen well, to know you. I, I, go ahead. No, 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 no. I happen to know you fairly well, and, and you are not a political hack. Not at all. You, you're not a creature of City Hall. You're not buddies with a bunch of politicians that get this nice job. I mean, it seems to me they looked at your credentials. They said, we need someone that knows what it means to operate in the private sector with some pretty high-powered, you know, Fortune 500 right. executive types, and that's what we need. I, I was very, very pleased to see that you ended up getting the job. Well, Mayor Bowden's a great leader. He makes a lot of great decisions, and I've told him that hiring me was <laughs> one of them. <laughs> uh, I agree, Marty. I mean, I, I think about the idea that I think we have too many political hacks. Go ahead. Yeah. I say it. You got to be politically correct. Um, political hacks. We need some marketplace principles, some marketplace mm -hmm. people who think that way in government. Yeah. And you know, actually, it's funny when I, uh, our mutual friend John D. Pasquale, yeah, came up to me at a barbecue last summer and said, you know, they're advertising this job. I think you'd be great. And I'm like, really? And. Uh, I called a couple of my friends and they loved the idea, so I, I, I threw my hat in and uh, our mutual friend Paul Scalzo was very encouraging. He says, you'll never get that job. He yeah. said, you know how many you know, people are going to apply for that, how many economic development professionals? And yeah. I said, well, and here I am. And so, you know, I mean, you've never done anything for Mayor Bowden. You've never, uh, you know. People it, think it, I might have been a political, but I'd met Mayor Bowden in the interview. That's incredible. I'd never met him before. All right. Uh, uh, and again, uh, He's really pro-business, and he's been really supportive of me. But my, my view is really to go ahead with the businesses market, you know, and okay. really market them. The phone number here is 438-2003. If you have a question, if you right now look out your window and there's a pothole, I want you to call in because this man <laughs> will be out there uh, to take care of that. Uh, yes, Dave, please go right ahead. Uh, Bruce, can you give me some indication or some flavor for what the legacy costs are for Danbury? You know, we hire, well, I mean, you're not that uh, unlike Reading. We hire people, we hire police officers. They can retire at age 50. All of a sudden, you've got these retirement benefits that are accumulating. 
what, what does it look like for Denver? You know, that's not the best question for me in that I'm not really completely sure okay. about a lot of that. You know, my role is, is unique in that I'm basically hired to go out and you know, make drum sure... Drum up business. Bi well, not even drum up business. Just make sure the businesses have a channel into City Hall. Okay. And, uh, I mean, there's multiple facets. There's also the idea that when someone's interested in Danbury, I'm the first mm -hmm. port of contact. So what, what are some of the critical elements that you get involved with for uh, enabling companies to thrive and survive in Danbury? I mean, how do, how do you entice business into Danbury? Well, there are many ways. Uh, I think that the primary way, when you get to understand this whole model, mm -hmm. you realize that it's the commercial market primarily through which the opportunities come. State guys will tell you that, federal guys will tell you that. You, you This idea that you can market the city on websites, search engine, all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff, and go on, it doesn't really happen that way. What happens is companies through different pause processes, different reasons, decide they might be interested in Danbury. Mm -hmm. My role then is really, at the end of the day, I, is to outperform our competitors, which is every other town. So we try to have a, a prepackaged set of things. We have incentives. Mm -hmm. You have to focus on this for a second. Mm -hmm. Incentives are really based on state statutes and then city ordinances. Okay. So what happens is the state pretty much tells us what we can offer them. So every town pretty much offers the same incentives for mm -hmm. the most part. We have some special things we're doing downtown and whatnot. But the, the real, I think, value add that we provide uh, when a company's trying to come in is just mm -hmm. the idea that we can service them and outperform our competitors. Well, what are some of the, uh, recently there have been uh, uh, quite a few successes. There's a there's a company from, I think it's Italy coming in, uh, uh, up on Ridgebury Road. Yeah, Is that Switzerland. Switzerland, my bad. You're my in bad. Southern Europe. You're yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but what's it, give us a story well, behind that. It's a, and, well, and let, me give that you a, let me give you a bigger picture first, which okay. is if you look at what's going on in Danbury right now, for a period of time, and especially right now, we lead the state in almost every economic you know, leading economic indicator. Yeah. Lowest unemployment rate, uh, most jobs created. A private study was done recently that we've kind of been very interested in, which shows that Danbury's recovered 65% of the jobs lost during the recession. Wow. And you might think, well, you know, 65%. To give you some comparison, first of all, it leads the state by a wide margin. The U.S. as a whole is 40%. The rest of Connecticut is 30%. So we're 35 points ahead yeah. of of what Connecticut is yeah, doing. Yeah, we had so. Nick Perna come and give a little, you know, he's a he's an economist and he says that the real growth isn't happening in down Fairfield County, but it's in the upper right. in Fairfield County where it's, you're uh, it's kind of it's a not the ninety five corridor, it's this eighty four yeah. corridor up here. And I think it's frankly because of your job performance. Would I'm, you I'm, agree? Let's go yeah, I do agree, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Before I got here, nothing good of Exactly. It's, Tumbleweeds, it was terrible, but now that you're here there's happiness but I mean, in the really, streets. We are Chicken in every solid. pot. I mean most people don't know that Dan very sends over 10 percent of the sales re revenue re sales tax revenue to the state is that right um, the other thing is as you you know look at all of this we have a very diverse economy which is great I mean I used to work for 3m right. and 3m was always in trouble somewhere and always doing great somewhere and we have a little bit of that in Danbury but it's our skilled workforce uh, it's our the universities being here mm -hmm. we've got multiple industries defense pharma Medical, bio, uh, obviously retail is huge here. Is there anything so, new coming in that you see in the next two, three years? There are a lot of different opportunities. Uh, we typically don't talk about specifics, but we're getting inquiries all the time. I'll give mm -hmm. you some, some quick ideas. Matrix, corporate center, the largest corporate center, or largest business building, I think, in New England. Is that right? Is uh, one third empty. Okay. So we've got multiple space for them. Okay. Uh, there's a, a lot of other new buildings. There's a proposed building I uh, can't really talk a lot about right now, but should it come to pass, would bring you know a thousand or more new jobs in. Is it really? getting a client. Is it possible to get manufacturing? Whoa, 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 whoa. We have some breaking news here. Okay, you're speaking in code, which I understand because you operate in a you know very high level. But you're saying there is some sort of a firm. Is this a service firm, a manufacturing firm, or you really can't say? I'm saying that there's not a firm right now, but we have to go recruit one, but a, a company is willing to build a facility for them to suit should we find them. Oh, okay. And, and this would mean... it'll be a state-of-the-art corporate facility. And, 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 okay. and so the reason I even mention is that those are all opportunities we have right now. You asked about manufacturing. Mm -hmm. It's a, in a sense, it's a good problem to have, mm -hmm. but we don't have a lot of capacity to, to bring manufacturing in. Mm. We don't have, I mean, the zoned land for manufacturing and even the open land where you could change the zoning is yeah. pretty much taken up. So long term, you have to look at, you know, redevelopment, mm -hmm. reinvestment, raising buildings. 
Um, one new, uh, it was an unfortunate thing, but you know, it creates opportunity is the Donnelly building will be available, uh -huh. uh, you know, the old printing company. So um, we've got all kinds of, you know, different opportunities. In the, uh, now this the company, the, is this art. company from Switzerland that's coming in. Balimo what? Air Controls. Balimo Air Controls. They're not coming in, they're, they've been here for a long time. Okay, but they're adding a, a large plant what, right what next to Bowling they're, 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 they're currently right? in a lease building uh, with about 80,000 square feet. They're building their own facility of 200,000 square feet. Okay. It's actually off Turner Road. Right. Right on the edge of Ridgefield. Yeah. You probably heard about it and it was in the paper. Well, there's some residents at the <laughs> north end of Ridgefield that aren't thrilled about it because it's going to mean traffic in their area. Mm -hmm. The homes that they purchased were adjacent to commercially zoned property. So one would think that they took that into consideration when they bought it. But I'm sure that you, as the economic development uh, person for Danbury, will come up with some way that you can work traffic flow so it doesn't come <laughs> screaming through a residential neighborhood of my beloved fellow Ridgefield residents. Can't you agree to that? For you, I'm going to go right in and start working on that. I think we can <laughs> route it somewhere, you know, proper use of shrubbery. I think, uh, you know, accommodations Marty, you should be, be lobbying made. for some of the painting contracts that are going to come out of this stuff. Well, no, I, I mean, yeah, we would love to do, con you know, since the president gave me this company, I didn't really build it. He just, I got it okay. from the president. Yeah, you're going to go there. Uh, I got it, yeah. Oh, we went there. You weren't here for the okay. first half. It's probably it. best. You'll we had to get him oxygen. I, I, it was close. I had this blood vessel right here was about to pop out. But, um, well, I think so. I think you can help. It's usually people. It's not, you know, organizations or institutions or government. Well, I mean, but but I mean, if we just take this, if we just take this Belimo Corporation, here they are. They're coming in. They're going to build, thanks to your help and the and, and the city's being mm -hmm. open for business, at least positive towards these entities wanting to come in. But they're building a two hundred thousand square foot. Do you know how much? Concrete, electrical, mm -hmm. heating, air conditioning, sheetrock, yes, painting, landscaping on the outside, just the construction activity involved with mm -hmm. that. And then how many permanent jobs are they going to have there afterwards? I think, well, they've currently got like 200 something. I think they're going to probably add another 200. So this is their U.S. headquarters. Okay, so well, it's not just employment, but mm -hmm. it's everything that, that comes together with it. It's a domino effect. Absolutely. Let me give you a, a more concrete example on that one the hospital. A hospital is built mm. right now basically doubling the size. I don't think people really That's a great hospital. understand that it's going to be twice as big as it is now. Mm -hmm. That's a $200 million project. They estimate the economic impact on the area will be around $200 million just in terms of the construction, yeah. the employment, uh, what that's going to add, infrastructure change. So these projects are huge. We've got the $100 million Performing Arts Center mm -hmm. in Westcon. On the west side, that's another one. Sure. What, are, what are some of the obstacles or barriers that, that companies bring up, or what are the deterrents to coming to Connecticut in general, and maybe possibly Danbury? For example, energy costs. We have the highest electrical rates in the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, do people ever bring that stuff up? Do they talk about the tax rates? What are they? What, what well, are the obstacles? There's, there's different levels that you would you know, look at. That. Mm -hmm. For example, if we're competing against other mm -hmm. Connecticut towns, or let's say the region, New York okay. City, Westchester, or the island, uh, et cetera, boroughs. Um, that's not really much of a factor because, you know, we're pretty much looking at similar costs. They come here actually to save money. Okay. Um, and then, practically speaking, you don't often see somebody who's in Kentucky say, gee, we think we're going to move to Connecticut. Mm -hmm. People that come here come for, here for a specific reason. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very attractive place. What I have a better argument with is actually talking to people who are saying, well, we're going to move. Mm -hmm. You know, you say, somebody says, well, you know, Tennessee has offered us 40 acres or whatever. Mm -hmm. for, but you look at the demographic, and you say, where's the workforce to fill their factory? Yeah. It's not there. Yeah. That's the biggest single you know, mm -hmm. asset that Connecticut. I don't, what, I don't, you know the statistics, something, there's 150 universities within 50 miles of here or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a phenomenal yeah. area as far as having a skilled workforce and developable. I mean, we work real hard, by the way, with, and, and are starting to do even more so with the colleges, WestCon and uh, Naugatuck Valley, and, and, and trying to really develop we find as I go out and talk with some of the different, especially the technology companies, there's a huge shortage here of what we might call half engineers or technicians, electronic, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. electrical technicians, yeah, yeah. precision instrument operators. If yeah. you have that skill set and you're unemployed, go get a job. They're here. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Um, uh, we, you know, it's interesting when you talk about like Belimo is already here. Another classic example of a, a wonderful corporate citizen is Bowringer Engelheim. Correct. Now their their property straddles Ridgefield and Danbury, so if they decide to build Building Ten on the Ridgefield ride, uh, Ridgefield side, it's like, 
happy days are here again. We get the building permit, yeah. we get the taxes and everything like that. But I mean, that's a classic example, a wonderful German company. They're producing drugs that, that, uh, that help with AIDS and HIV and, right. and things like that. I mean, these are just wonder drugs, highly profitable, highly skilled people needed mm -hmm. in, the, in these jobs, mm -hmm. well-paying jobs. I mean, this is the kind of thing that I see you working on, is holding on to what businesses are here and that they'll, they'll expand here right. and not move somewhere else. I've been quoted pretty much every time I'm interviewed as saying that my number one priority is to make sure that the businesses we always have, already have, yeah. stay and grow. I mean, yeah. that, if, if you look at it, even like in corporate, if you get a, a, a sales territory mm -hmm. or, a, or a region or a country, that's your strategy. Mm -hmm. You can't yeah. grow if you lose major accounts. Well, and like you said, a, a big key to the success of Danbury is someone that's in charge that knows what they're doing. We had Mayor Bowden on the show two or three months ago, uh -huh. and he is in command of all the facts. He knows the nuts and bolts of Danbury inside and out. You know, the guy's two, three steps ahead of everybody. It's, it's really amazing, his ability to anticipate. and yeah. you know, I, I, I really admire it. And, and yet, at the same time, like in my case, he's very hands-off. He's letting me pretty much create. He's not micromanaging you, looking over yeah, you. Yeah, he's he's a great leader. It's been it's been a lot of fun. I didn't know what to expect. Like I said, I didn't I didn't never met the guy. He's yeah. watching the show right now, by the way. <laughs> oh, he studies. I, I, some, he tivos uh, in, studies I in. Doubt forget that. about it. <laughs> I doubt. I hope he's not watching. The show. You no know, I talking about uh, keeping businesses here and then attracting new ones. It reminds me of a poem, which I'll share with you right now. Are you ready? <laughs> Please, I can't wait. Make new friends. But keep the old. One is silver, the other gold. What do you think? Deep. Okay, and that's a wrap. No, we still that's have more rich. time. Isn't yeah, that you, good? you should have been on uh, I Married an Axe Murderer. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're <laughs> reading poetry of that. It's I too know, it's, funny. It's a little frightening. So, how'd the interview go? Well, you read some lame poem. Or <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't read it. I did it from heart. I, I, I remember it that. Is, from I heart. could tell it was hard. Let's talk a little bit about revitaling downtown. <laughs> okay, now it's interesting because we are a cultural melting pot. We're not a cultural salad bowl. That's a little bit mm -hmm. different. The tomatoes are over here, the lattice is over here, the radishes are over here. We like to think of ourselves as a melting pot. And when people look at downtown, they say, hey, wait a minute, you know, it's not like it used to be back in the 50s when I'd go with Susie and see a show and we get an ice cream at the sock hop or whatever it was. How are you going about revitalize, revitalizing downtown, and uh, what are some ideas you have along those lines? I've been reading these articles lately, and they're, they're kind of along the lines of, wouldn't it be nice? You know, if, you, yeah. know, you know, birds were chirping and, you know, families were strolling. And, and, and I think everybody looks at that and says, this would be wonderful mm -hmm. to, to have. And uh, when you look at the reality of our downtown, it's got, I called it in one interview, an unpolished jewel. It's got amazing potential, mm -hmm. but it's not an overnight thing. I mean, there, there's, if you look at a, how do you do a strategy, there's like four or five different things you have to do. Okay. Um, one of them, and probably the main one, is you have to develop, or private industry, private you know, commercial development has to occur to create reasons for people to come downtown. If Connecticut Magazine had an article on the cover this month that said the best restaurant in Connecticut is in Main Street, Danbury, right. people would fly here. Yeah. It's not that hard to do. You get a few businesses that are really great. Now, what's the steps from going to nothing or not a lot of those mm -hmm. to some of those very complex? These are private, privately owned buildings, private businesses. Uh, people have you know, the right to do what they want, develop their property, invest in it. We need to get some more investment in, you know, infrastructure downtown, buildings, people that own them. Mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. we're not communists, we can't confiscate them. Yeah. But developing businesses that are attractive to people, mm -hmm. having reasons to come downtown, the Palace Theater, redevelopment of that, yeah. um, you know, music, uh, restaurants. The Danbury clubs. Ice Arena, I think, uh, Ice you know, Arena. We, we've uh, been Whalers are a great with, example. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah. the Danbury Whalers, we've been pretty right. involved with that. I mean, that, that's an right. infusion of two, 3,000 people, and they go out to eat afterwards, right. and they're bringing revenue in. And that leads to the second thing is which you have to have great events. And we do a pretty good job of that between, you know, the hockey team. Yeah. City Center does some, you know, pretty nice 
Sunday. Bad Sunday. gospel in the park last Sunday. Yeah. Well, Marty, you promote the Whalers all the time on the show. Yeah, I mean, it's really fun. Yeah. I, I mean, they you know, fun. they do uh, drop the gloves yeah, and hit my, each other, a grown man hitting each other, and they get two-minute penalty as opposed to, it was you fun know, to watch assault my, with a deadly weapon, you know, a court. I watched case. my daughter drop the puck, and I watched her screaming during a fight, you know. And, oh, uh, yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> it was it was quite a, quite, a, quite a fun night. No, but I mean. Um, the, but the thing about it is, is you, you know, you get good events. We're thinking about doing a, a, a major conference, which we'll announce hopefully soon, as another event for Dan Barry. So you've got to have great events. Wait a minute. There's another little teaser there. You're speaking in code. What's the event? <coughs> is it, are we going to have a U2 concert in the middle of the We need higher clearance. I, you know? I, I, I know, I know. There's, there's, a, look, there's something bringing a thousand jobs, there's, and there's an event that's coming. Yeah. Come on, spill your beans. You told me I wasn't political before. I'm starting to get the skill set. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, there, there is something in the works. A little teaser. Is that is, is that, that polka festival we've heard so much about? The polka is a longer term plan. A longer term plan. Well, whatever yeah. it is, you're going to have to come back and announce it on the show. Uh, well, we I, I expect on that. that. Uh, just to finish the thought, the, the other major thing we need is we need to get people to actually come and live downtown. You know, the Kennedy Place, you know, housing project would be, yeah. a, or, or um, development would be a potential for that. That's all over the uh, downtown revitalization, the task force plan, uh, uh, pr a report. Right, right, right. It's a big component of it is you have to have people who are living downtown and then eating and recre right. you know, entertainment downtown, that sort of thing. Um, so you need those things. And, and then we also just need some influx of energy from the schools. We need a lot more of the youth presence downtown. And I, I, you know, these are all, you just, they don't happen overnight. We got, we got about a minute left. This is the lightning round. I want, you, I want you to give us a letter grade, A, B, C, D, or F. The economy in Greater Danbury right now, A, B, C, D, or F. Relative to what? Oh, come on, just give me a grade. Relative to the, the rest of New well, England. Well, we're doing well. I, I would give us at least a B plus. Okay, and then uh, the downtown do vitalization, where would you think you're at with that? We're making real progress on that. Let's, let's say that's a solid B right now in terms of the path we're on. We've got some results ahead, I hope. Okay, and Bart, then uh, uh, plans for the future. Last question. So, no, not a question, but in, in, your, uh, in your closing, you need to make, do a, one shout out to the president for making you successful as a small business yeah, owner, excellent. okay? Well, first, I want to thank you very much, Mr. Tumula, for coming in. Good to be here. And thank you very much for what you're doing for Danbury. I, I appreciate really appreciate it. it. I want your pink tie meeting those new corporations coming in and saying, hey, we're Danbury. We're open for business. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for coming in. <laughs> Next week, we're very excited because we have Mark Greenberg. Yes, that Mark Greenberg, the guy running for Congress. The guy, you've seen all the lawn signs everywhere. He's one of those dreaded wage payers that isn't paying his fair share. We would love to have Mark Greenberg go to Congress. He's going to be on this show next week. And also Carolina. Carolina is a very interesting, you know, if you want to know about the greatness of America, ask an immigrant. As a matter of fact, there's a lady from Scaldon right in the studio right here, and she says, yay, America. She does. you got to take my word for it. We'll see you next time on the Marty Eisen Show, where you always get the truth. Come on. What else are you going to do on a Thursday night? We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Thanks a lot.